Um, right, well, other people's pay is a, is a topic which um, everybody finds um, fascinating. But in the past, pay was often sort of shrouded in some mystery. And in the recent years, we've, we've tended to shed light on this, often a dangerous thing to do, because when we see what people earn, many people don't like what they see. Now, the last few months, as you're aware, has focused on, on, on the, the, uh, the credit crunch and uh, the bankers have been the villain of the piece. I'll say something about that a bit later on. Um, but, you know, just a, a month or two back, Harriet Harman was, was uh, in full uh, class warrior mode against um, Fred Goodwin, um, threatening with legislation when he refused to give back his pension, his uh, severance payments and whatever. And you may remember that she said, you may be within the rules, but this is not enforceable in the court of public opinion. Well, of course, this is dangerous talk, and we've now slipped to, you know, a few weeks later into this kind of Jacobin mood we're in at the moment, where, uh, where politicians themselves are, 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 being, uh, are under fire for, for what they've been taking uh, legitimately and illegitimately from the public purse. And uh, nobody's really safe about this uh, at the moment. Um, there was a, a TV presenter, I think, last week, or a radio presenter, who um, was interviewing an MP who kind of argued back and said, how much do you earn? And she revealed that she earned £92,000 a year, which, you know, is kind of a fairly low level of for, for presenters of that kind. But this created all sorts of indignation as well, and kind of pensioners in Scunthorpe were writing in and saying, you know, can she, can she possibly justify £92,000 a year for asking a few questions? Um, so it's, it's a difficult area. Uh, it reminds us that uh, you know last year, if you can think that far back, Jonathan Ross was in big trouble, wasn't he, for being rude on the radio? And one of the things which outraged people that he was earning some colossal amount of money a year. Um, and then, of course, there's uh, Premiership footballers, and uh, Andy Burnham, the culture secretary, was giving them a going over um, a week or two back when he was calling for all sorts of reforms in the Premier League finances because these people were overpaid and so forth. So, uh, I mean, one thing I want to talk about tonight, then, is the people at the top of the pay distribution and, you know, what we think about that and, and, and why that is such a big issue at the moment. But another thing I want to talk about is the people at the other end as well. And uh, there we're talking about the national minimum wage uh, in the context of a recession where... Uh, many low-paid workers are, are really very fearful at the moment of losing their jobs. Um, so that's the second thing I want to talk about, pay at the bottom. And the third thing I want to talk about briefly, because uh, you know, I, don't, I don't want to go into this fully, but I want to talk a little bit about the gender pay gap, because uh, again, this is an area where Harriet Harman has been very, very active. Uh, and uh, it's an area which she wants to attack in her new equality bill, which you may remember before all this storm broke about MPs and stuff, the last significant bit of political action was her coming to uh, the House of Commons with this um, very wide-ranging equality bill. I don't know whether you've tried to read it, but it's a colossal document covering page after page after page of stuff. And really, uh, although it was initially uh, supposed to be a kind of tidying up document, it's in fact turned out to be a considerable extension of, of, of government power. Anyway, so we've got these three areas I want to talk about. All this stuff is extremely topical. But, you know, as so often in, in, in economics, uh, there, there's precedence for these kinds of things. I was going to show you a slide, and I don't suppose you can see this, so you might pick it up in your camera here. Um, no, you can't. Well, this is... Uh, uh, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you can. I'll, I'll put it there, right? Okay. Um, I, I, I was going to project some of this. But this is a... A uh, strange artifact which, if you go to the Louvre in Paris, uh, you will be able to find. It's about seven foot tall. It's a black uh, stone object, a black column, uh, which was found in Iran in 1901. And written on it is uh, a long list of laws and regulations called the Code of Hammurabi. And Hammurabi was a, a Babylonian king from 4000 BC. And what I want to mention him is that he was amongst the first rulers that we know about who tried to lay down what people should be paid. Um, he appears to have been a powerful and ruthless uh, despot who was determined to have his way. And the Code of Hammurabi, which is set out on this stone, 
uh, is an interesting document. It lays down a total of 282 regulations uh, about everything under the sun, uh, including the first enunciation, even before the Bible, of um, the principle of an eye for an eye. But I mention it in particular because it, it gives precise daily wages for labourers, potters, tailors, rope makers, masons, and other people, uh, other, other trades of the time. Um, now, obviously, time has moved on. Uh, looking at some of the miscellaneous provisions of this code, uh, clearly they've been sort of uh, superseded. Um, there's one which I, I, I also like to mention. It says, if a sister of a god, whether that means, I suppose, some sort of religious uh, votary or something, if a sister of a god open a tavern or enter a tavern to drink, then this woman shall be burnt to death. Now, clearly, uh, the, the government at the moment, amongst its other concerns, is concerned about women drinking too much. But I think the, uh, the idea of putting people to death for this is probably a little outdated. Um, but that, uh, that aspect of it, of course, has is, is, is gone with the wind. But the, the, the idea that you try and control wages in some ways is an idea which comes back and comes back and comes back again. Uh, in uh, medieval Europe, uh, you had the, the doctrine of the just wage, for example, which tried to lay down um, uh, you know, a wage which was acceptable in the eyes of the, the, the church. And as late as 1891, Pope Leo XIII issued an encyclical spelling out how Catholics ought to resist capitalist greed and support wages based on justice, an idea which has been knocking around for a long time. In the 20th century, of course, it became more secular. It wasn't a, a religious thing anymore. Um, but you had uh, insistent demands uh, from the political left for some notion of social justice or distributive justice. Uh, now, um, we were talking before, Andrew, about Hayek. Um, this is something, uh, the, the idea of social justice or distributive justice was something which Hayek uh, took considerable exception to. Um, and in a lecture in the 1970s, uh, he, he writes about the idea of social justice. He says, I quote, a little inquiry shows that though a great many people are dissatisfied with the existing pattern of distribution, none of them has really any clear idea of what pattern you would regard as just. And that, of course, is, is, the, is the, the crux of the matter because um, uh, Hayek says, you know, distributive justice is, a, is an nonsensical idea because there's nothing to distribute. It's not as if all this, uh, you, you know, you have a pile of stuff which is available for sharing out or something. This pile of stuff was actually created by the incentives which, the, 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 which, which pay generates, which pay and profits generate. And he's quite right in saying that, that people don't really, you know, people may huff and puff about what uh, the, the way in which pay is distributed at the moment, but it's very difficult to get them to pin down exactly what they think will be better disposition of pay. A couple of years ago, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation had a crack at this. Um, they had a study which pointed out that, uh, which found that 75% of the population put, thought that people at the top were paid too much. But when it came down to it, less than 30% of them thought that the government should do anything about it. Um, and the reason for this was that they perceived the difficulties involved in actually trying to lay down uh, a pay system. How can we possibly decide in a complex economy of 29 million people working in you know, hundreds and thousands of different types of job, how they should be paid in detail? Uh, it's, it's how would you do it? A kind of modern Hammurabi laying down details or whatever, more likely a huge bureaucracy of thousands of civil servants trying to weigh evidence and so forth. Um, now, now you're, you're all quite young in this room, but I'm, I'm, I'm getting very old. I do remember the 1960s. There actually was an attempt to do this kind of thing, and it was a complete disaster. Um, under Harold Wilson's government of, of the 1960s, um, uh, there was set up something called a Prices and Incomes Board, which, um, amongst other things, adjudicated on pay claims. Um, the idea which now seems absurd and impractical, um, was taken very seriously by politicians at the time. What it involved was setting a norm for pay increases, which was based on some kind of average or aggregate uh, increase in productivity. And everything else was judged against this. Should you get pay increase above uh, the rate of increase in productivity or below it? And uh, you know, the civil servants were spending ages and ages trying to work this out. 
the justification for this in, in, the, uh, in, in the 60s was that this was seen as an anti-inflation device, a way of keeping down inflation, which was becoming a problem at the time. Um, Hayek, of course, um, saw through this. Um, he pointed out the fallacies of the argument, uh, because basically inflation is a monetary thing. It's driven by uh, the money supply and the differences between Hayek and Friedman and so forth. But essentially, uh, you know, both, both parties agree that, 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 that it's money which drives inflation. It's not, it's not uh, pay as such. And Hayek, uh, apart from this criticism about the inflation thing, also pointed out the long-term consequences of trying to control the pattern of wages. He was an economist, remember, although he later became uh, this sort of um, more politically oriented thing. He was an economist who was trained in classical theory. He saw the free labour market as the only way of allocating labour to its most effective uses. Uh, so long as there wasn't inf interference from the government or powerful monopolistic trade unions, which of course he opposed, um, a shortage of labour in a particular occupation, a particular uh, field or industry, would be signalled by a rise in wages. Um, or, uh, and this is important actually for something I'll say later on, or by a change in the conditions attached to a job. Because uh, going back to Adam Smith, we've had this notion that, that the, the relative attractiveness of jobs is, is partly to do with pay, but it's partly to do with the conditions, the attractiveness or unattractiveness of the conditions associated with the job. But anyway, Hayek saw that um, um, a shortage of labour produces uh, a change in the wage rate or something like that. Uh, this makes uh, an existing employers use expensive labour uh, more effectively. Uh, this boosts productivity. It attracts workers in from other fields where their, 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 their work is undervalued. Um, and on the other hand, uh, the other side of the picture is that uh, there will be an excess supply of labour if, if the wage rate is too high. This should lead to a fall in, la in wages, encouraging workers to move out of that area into areas where their, their, their productivity is higher. And higher consists that um, attempts to set non-market clearing wages, either by government or by trade unions, leads to lower productivity, slower growth, unemployment, and a host of other ills. And where th he also points out, this is very important for, 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 for the way in which Hayek conceptualises the use of, uh, of the state in, in, in labour markets, uh, where the law is used in an appropriate, inappropriate way to set artificial wages, it produces incentives to cheat, to get around the rules, and to bring the law into disrepute. And of course, we're seeing at the moment the, the, the problems which happen when the law is brought into disrepute. It's a very important issue for the stability of, of government and society. So this type of analysis of the benign effects of markets uh, in relation to pay is, I think, uh, this type of analysis is timeless. We don't need to worry about income's policy anymore. I don't think that idea is coming back. But there is a, a, you know, a, a, a persistent tendency to meddle in by populist governments, and we're seeing uh, a lot of this at the moment. So, I said I was going to talk about top pay, I was going to talk about pay at the bottom, and I was going to take, talk about gender pay. So let me talk a little bit about pay at the top. Take bankers' pay. There has recently been a hugely irrational anti-banker mood in the country. Bankers have been seen as, as public enemy number one. They've been accused of gambling with our money and bringing the country to the verge of ruin. Um, they're seen as, as you know, complete villains of uh, the peace, uh, they're, they're totally immoral people uh, and all this kind of stuff. And they must be breathing uh, a lot easier the last couple of weeks when they see that politicians are taking on that role instead. The, the circus has moved on. But let's, let's not forget bankers. Um, the interesting thing about the, 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 uh, the, the, the financial crisis is that, of course, um, a, a lot of public debate has, has focused on the individuals who are associated with it. But in fact, it's a more systematic thing. You, the, you can, politicians were, were pointing the finger on this, but politicians themselves were, I, I would argue, in, in, in large measure responsible for the financial crisis by running. 
uh, massive fiscal deficits, by messing up pensions, by changing the tax regime in this country, thus um, putting pension funds under, under pressure and so forth. In the United States, you had inappropriate interventions in the housing market to tell uh, financial institutions to lend to people with very, uh, very poor uh, security, and that's, you know, hence the, uh, all the problems in, in the savings and loans and so forth in the States. Uh, so the politicians were involved, the Bank of England was, was involved, and, and, the, and the, the, the Fed in the United States, for failing to take asset inflation into account when, uh, when, when trying to set monetary policy. They just didn't seem to think it mattered. Alan Greenspan, people like this, said, you know, asset, asset bubbles, nothing to do with, 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 with the real economy. Um, so they were, they, they were in the wrong, I think. The, the, the regulators, the financial services um, people in this country, um, produced reams of regulatory documents. I mean, it's been suggested by an estimate by Philip Booth that there's something like one million paragraphs of guidance that the FSA generated in the last 10 years, and yet they still, uh, we still had uh, the, the, the credit crunch and so on. So you've got all these groups involved, you've got uh, financial regulators, you've got the banks, you've got politicians, and also in a sense you've also got the general public. And the, th the thing which I, I always point out to people who, who slag off the, the bankers and so forth is, is I point to uh, the way in which we all overstretched ourselves, in the, well, not you lot, but I mean, uh, pe pe people with jobs and so forth overstretched themselves in the mortgage market. Um, they, they sought higher returns on savings through putting, put, putting money into, into, into higher return funds, which were in fact running risky, uh, risky books and so forth. So everybody's involved in this, and yet bankers have been um, uh, particularly focus on. Incidentally, um, you read the IEA stuff, I hope. Last week, the IEA brought out a very nice um, book which you can download from the IEA website called Verdict on the Crash, which um, has a, a, another look at the financial crisis and, and, and elaborates on some of the points I was just making there. But leaving aside the, the responsibility of bankers for the crisis, which I think has been overstated, um, there was nothing particularly irrational about the way in which bankers were paid, the bonus culture, if you like. There is a huge literature in economics and management, for that matter, on performance-related pay, which bankers' bonuses are, are perhaps a, an extreme manifestation, but nevertheless it's the same principle. Economists have generally argued that linking pay to performance is desirable wherever possible. And particularly for top executives and traders, where small changes, very small changes in performance, can lead to uh, to very high uh, changes in profits and returns to companies and so forth. And the, the idea uh, throughout the 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 eighties and nineties in the literature was that we should be doing more of this, um, we're not, not not less of this, as people argue today. Now, people might accept this on a, on a rational basis. They argue that, nevertheless, that allowing people to keep bonuses or to uh, take generous severance packages, the Fred Goodwin kind of stuff, in the current climate is very different. There are arguments, I guess, that where the state has taken responsibility for banks, then they, they, they can impose slightly different conditions and so on. But people generally have a contractual right to compensation, so long as it was freely agreed in advance. And it's not only bankers where failure is rewarded. You may, uh, if, you, if you're a football fan, you may have noticed that um, uh, a couple of months ago, Chelsea published their annual report, which showed that, they, showed that they spent £23 million last year in paying off two managers, Jose Marino and, uh, Jose Marino and uh, Avram Grant, and five assistant coaches. £23 million on five people. That's quite a big reward for failure, which is not particularly to do with the banks. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, they failed, they should go, they should be sacked. Um, and that's um, an argument which um, people who've never employed anybody um, put very easily. But I can assure you that it is not that easy to get rid of somebody, particularly where, uh, in the case of Fred Goodwin, for example, 
It was a judgment call that she made. He didn't do anything actually wrong. He just got it wrong in some sense. That's what capitalism is all about. It's about getting it wrong in the hope that out of that somewhere, somewhere somebody will get it right. So what, what, I mean, what Fred Goodwin did was to make a wrong judgment call about a takeover of a bank, basically. But he didn't break his contract in any way. And if he had dug his heels in and refused to go, they'd have had to go through a long procedure of, 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 of dismissing him. He would, it would have dragged through the courts and so forth. And this is not a thing which, which people should undertake lightly. So it's hardly surprising that people were given, uh, you know, that he was paid off. You could argue that he was paid too much, but that's, uh, that's to do with his original contract. Whatever the current situation, we shouldn't look back, we should look forward. And I believe that the government is wrong in attempting to legislate for future behaviour of firms by putting caps on bonuses, by conditions, in, in how they can be paid, in shares and what types of shares and so forth. Top executives, top traders, whether they're in the financial sector or elsewhere, face highly demanding jobs. And they won't take them in the United Kingdom unless they can get a return which is commensurate with their commitment to the thing. They're also not going to negotiate one-way contracts, which don't reward them very well for success. This is what the government is saying, which should cap their, their thing. And yet at the same time, um, allow banks to sack them for poor results. If that kind of pay regime is established in this country, then top talent will either go abroad or into private, unregulated funds where the government's writ doesn't run. They will get round whatever rules are placed on, 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 on holding shares for years, for example, and things like that. Because banks who are wishing to hold on to key players will find other ways of rewarding them, whatever the government tries to cap it at. Um, basically, you've got mutual benefits here of the employee and the employer and they will find a way around as they've always done in the past. Right, before I leave uh, top pay, I'd just like to fill you in on one or two, to, to one or two things. Um, I don't know what you know about the pay distribution. If you're not an economist, you probably haven't dug into this. But um, pay is, it is true, more unequally distributed in the UK than in some other countries. But this is often exaggerated in political discussions of this. Um, if you take a measure like the Gini coefficient, which is the most frequently quoted measure in, in, in this area, um, the Gini coefficient for the UK is, uh, is not very different from a whole bunch of countries, including Italy, New Zealand, Ireland, and so forth. We're a, a less unequal pay distribution than they have in the United States, which is kind of the world champion in this, but we're not that far out of line with most of our uh, most of our uh, competitive countries. Secondly, there's been a lot of talk about how the pay distribution has widened, that, that it's become more unequal over time in the UK. Well, this is true, but uh, most, of that, uh, most of that widening of the pay distribution took place in the 1980s and early 1990s. Um, and the situation has stabilised since then. There's been very little change over the last 15 years or so. The expansion, the, the widening of the, uh, of the pay distribution in the 80s and early 90s was associated with a range of factors such as increased globalisation, the communications revolution, um, which, for example, widened the market for entertainers of all kinds, including footballers, which is the, the you know, the, the whole... Um, 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 that the whole expansion of footballers' pay in the UK has resulted from, uh, from sat satellite broadcasting, which is a, a product of the, of, the, of the 1990s. Without that, um, footballers would be on a much more modest uh, payments. Nowadays, uh, the Premier League in this country is watched by, you know, 100 million people in countries all around the world, which was not technically possible. Therefore, the money has come in, and it's a classic case for economists of rent, scarcity payment for top talent. If there's more money coming in, it goes to the top talent. It doesn't go. To, that's why all the football clubs are halfway bankrupt. It all goes to the, the top talent who 
uh, are the scarce resource in there. So it was things like that. It was, it was increased globalisation, the communications revolution, increased competition and deregulation, which opened up markets uh, all over the place, not just in this country. And also, to some extent, it was the decline of trade union power, which, which broke up some of the, 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 old, uh, the old rigidities in the UK labour market and elsewhere. Now, all these factors, uh, which led to uh, a temporary, or, or at least a, a, not temporary, but a widening of the pay gap, which is now um, levelled off, um, these uh, factors were associated with rapid income, more rapid economic growth, increases in productivity, wider choice for consumers, more opportunities for people. And indeed, you could argue fairer remuneration for many groups of, uh, of workers who had previously been excluded from markets or had their pay suppressed for one reason or another, uh, possibly by trade union power, whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, looking back, I keep mentioning footballers, and you asked me to talk about footballers in here, but you can, you can, you can, uh, you can look back again to, to, to uh, when I was a kid, a long time ago, uh, there was a maximum wage in football. And uh, what it, what it, up until 1960, uh, it was 20 pounds a week in the um, in the in the winter and 16 pounds in the summer. That was the maximum wage which you could pay in UK football. And um, I, however much you think Wayne Rooney, Wayne Rooney is a complete waste of space, um, I think it's well, slightly more than 20 pounds a week, or it's uh, 2009 equivalent. Okay, so a, a second thing I'm saying there is that the widening of the pay distribution was as a result of these factors which were broadly beneficial to, the, to, to everybody in the economy, if you like. Um, the third thing I would say about this widening gap, it was associated with falling unemployment, and it was associated with rising incomes even amongst the lowest 10% of earners in this country. That wasn't the case in the United States for reasons which uh, we could go into on another occasion. But certainly in this country, pay, even for the people at the bottom of the pay distribution, rose during this period. So it, 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 it was a period where, where um, everybody benefited in some sense. Anyway, let me, let me now go on, having, having mentioned very briefly there poorer workers, let me now go on to talk uh, about the second thing I wanted to which was um, uh, the national minimum wage. What can we say about the, 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 the national minimum wage which was introduced by the, by the Labour government? Um, there seems to be a view that the national minimum wage has been a success, as there have not been huge job losses as a consequence. I think we need to think about that a little bit. What a minimum wage does, if it has any meaning at all, if it's an effective minimum wage, is it sets a wage level which is above that which the market would generate, the equilibrium wage rate, if you like to use the economist's jargon. And if you set a wage above an equilibrium wage rate, then this will tend to reduce job opportunities and produce unemployment. Um, you could also argue, this, by the way, that, that, that minimum wage is not a particularly effective anti poverty advice if that's what you're interested in, because uh, many of the people who are picked up in, in, in the national minimum wage are young workers who don't particularly have, um, who live in families, who are supported in other ways, and, they, and the, the, the people at the bottom of the pile are people who are not in work at all, they're not the people who are, who are on, 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 on low wages. Anyway, um, the evidence since the introduction of the, the, uh, the minimum wage in 1999 is rather ambiguous. There's evidence that demand has indeed been affected in some areas. And care homes is one of the areas where, where, where there appears to have been um, a problem in, in, in terms of job losses as a consequence of introducing the minimum wage. There's also been suggestions that some working conditions have deteriorated. And this is, I think I mentioned just a bit before about whenever we talk about wages, we have to, have to think about the net advantage of jobs in terms of the working conditions as well as the, the, the wage. This is the Adam Smith story. Um, and one thing which, which um, some studies have suggested is that introducing the minimum wage has reduced training provided by employers for, uh, for low paid workers. It also led to decline in the quality of accommodation, tied accommodation provided to low paid workers. 
Uh, another area in which employers may try to get around minimum wages is, uh, you may have seen a, a court judgment recently about tips, where some uh, restaurant owners were, were using tips to top up uh, pay to the minimum wage, and that's now been ruled out of order. But it shows you that the way in which these things, uh, you know, you impose a law and then government, uh, then, then um, firms get round it one way or another. Anyway, but on the whole, um, give or take these small issues, um, the general consensus seems to have been that the national minimum wage hasn't had very much of a negative impact. But remember that much of the period since 1999 has been one of very high demand for labour. The irrelevance of the national minimum wage doesn't seem likely to persist as the downturn really takes hold. At the moment, uh, we've, we've had the downturn in terms of, of, of output and falling GDP, but we've only really begun to find uh, an increase in unemployment. And the, 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 the history of recessions is that uh, unemployment is a lagging part of the cycle that unemployment rises after uh, output falls and it recovers after output increases again. So there's a, a kind of lagging thing. Um, and in this kind of situation, you have to ask whether a national minimum wage is a, a really great policy. At the moment, employment is falling three to four times faster in Scotland, Humberside, the North West than in the country as a whole. And the idea of a national minimum wage set for everybody right across the country becomes particularly under strain uh, in a situation where different parts of the country are experiencing the recession in different ways. The impact of the minimum on the rest of the wage structure is also something which is worth thinking about because it shows the unanticipated consequences of messing around with wages in any way. If the minimum is fixed, or indeed pushed up year on year, but higher wages are free to fluctuate with demand, we would expect the gap between national minimum wages and other wages to get narrower. Right? Because here are these other wages above the national minimum wage, unemployment, etc., wages beginning to fall. But this, the wage floor, the national minimum wage can't fall, so the gap is getting up smaller. What this means is that the pay of an experienced skilled worker, uh, an exp sorry, an experienced unskilled worker, will fall relative to that of the new entrant unskilled worker. This will mean that employers will get much more selective. They will tend to take on older workers rather than younger workers. New workers, new entrants to the labour market become much more unattractive to uh, to employers. So countries which have high minimum wages find that in periods of recession, youth unemployment shoots through the roof. Right? And that's the danger, I think, which we, we face with the minimum wage at the moment, despite the fact it, it hasn't had cataclysmic consequences during the, the period of the great moderation and all this wonderful period we were going through. Uh, when, when Gordon Brown had abolished boom and bust, if you remember. Um, that's all gone now, and the fear is that, that, that um, we, we, we're going to run into a lot more trouble. Okay, the third area I wanted to talk about was, was the pay gap, and I do hope that, you know, if you haven't read this, it's, it's, it's a, a riveting read. I've sold the movie rights for an enormous amount of money. Um, the gender pay gap. As I said, Harriet Harman is making a big issue of this, um, possibly to position herself on the left with a forthcoming leadership election, probably just around the corner and so on. Um, the gender pay gap, um, the, 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 the internationally quoted measure of this is, uh, relates to men and women in full-time work, and it relates to hourly earnings. Um, and um, last year, when the figures uh, we have available relate to, uh, men in full-time work uh, are paid 17% more per hour than women. This is the gender pay gap. It's not the figure which was quoted by Harriet Harman um, when introducing the Equality Bill. It's a rather misleading figure she produced. But whatever. Whatever the gap is, it's seen as outrageous. Um, and it's something, you know, I've gone on 
quite a lot of radio shows and things talking about this, and it's people misunderstand what this figure means. What they think it means is that you and you are doing an identical job, but you're paid 17% more. This isn't the way in which the, uh, the, the gap arises. Um, men and women are not being paid differently for identical work. They're doing very different jobs. For example, women are 80% of primary school teachers, but they're only about a third of university lecturers. There's 75% of council workers. Women are 75% of council workers, but they're under 3% of firefighters. They're 85% of social workers, but they're less than 25% of police officers. So they're doing very different jobs. And these jobs are paid differently for a variety of supply and demand factors. And this is where the problem lies, because if you want to address this, if you're, if, if you're Harriet Harman and you want to address this, then you've got to find some way of dealing with the fact that men and women are doing different jobs. That, that part of the pay gap, which can be explained by men and women doing identical jobs, is piffling. The bulk of it is due to the job choices which men and women make, which are, which are, which are different, and career moves and so forth. Um, I mean, it's very easy to say, well, uh, somebody said to me the other day, well, you know, primary school teachers aren't paid as well as university lecturers, but they're much more important than academics because, you know, they, 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 they're moulding the, the, you know, the, um, our, fu our future, our children, whatever. And it sounds like a plausible argument to the non-economist or whatever. Um, but of course, it's a, you, know, you have to think, well, they, it doesn't work like that. To become a primary school teacher requires, um, nowadays, probably a degree in some teacher training or, a, or, a, or a, an extended degree. To become a university lecturer, you need, uh, you need a PhD, you need uh, years of, t of experience in some teaching, research, and so forth. And, you know, you typically, uh, university lecturers don't get into their stride pay-wise until they're significantly into their 30s, whereas primary school teachers can be in their earning, um, you know, 21, 22, something like that. So clearly the, the situation is entirely different. How do you approach these questions of, of, of equal pay for people doing different jobs? Um, Hayek, um, actually surprising, I was uh, reading up for, for, for this in the previous talk I gave. Hayek is actually, actually I, I found a quote where he said he approved of the slogan, equal pay for equal work. And I thought, well, what does that mean exactly? Reading further on, I see that he, what, what he didn't mean uh, was equal pay for work of equal value, which is the, the, the formation, the, 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 the expression which Harriet Harman uses, and indeed, which is there in, uh, was there in the Treaty of Accession when we joined the uh, European Union in 1973, because they, they have, uh, the, the equal, equal pay for equal work is a slogan which comes to us actually from, from the European Union. It's a very interesting notion, because it's, it's really a kind of 19th century notion, equal pay for equal work. Um, it's a hangover, really, from the Marxian labour theory of value. And indeed, you could say it's a distant, distant echo of the Code of Hammurabi, because Hammurabi lays down different uh, pay for different workers, which appear to be based on some kind of notion of some kind of multiple labour, you know, some kind of labour theory of value approach. Now, for the last few years, uh, the public sector in this country has been obliged to conduct pay audits to show the size of the pay gap between men and women. Um, and the new equality bill, which Harriet is putting through the House of Commons, is, uh, seeks to extend this to the private sector, to firms employing more than 250 people, who would also be faced with this requirement to audit their pay um, to, to, to see what the gaps are between men and women. In the public sector, this has led to a further development uh, from pay audits to job evaluations. And what job evaluations involve is bringing in a, a, 
highly paid consultants or team of consultants and to rate every job which the organisation has on a kind of point system based on elaborate subdivisions of characteristics such as know-how, which is this idea of you know, knowing what the job is about and so forth, problem solving and accountability. So accountability is to do with degrees of responsibility like managers and things like that. And this grading exercise works out points and adds them up and it determines where every different type of job should be placed on a single pay spine. And in this way, you can compare men and women who are doing different jobs and you can put them in, a, in categories where equal pay for equal work applies, this notion of equal work. So despite the, the, the fact it's often presented as being a modernising pay structure, in fact it's a very old idea, going back to the idea that there's something intrinsic to the work process that determines what people should be paid. It's know-how, it's problem solving and so on. This is really a modernised version of Marx's idea that you, know, you, you have different types of labour. It was the basis for pay structures in the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe. That's how they did it. In the public sector, it's, it's led to massive disputes, to a huge increase in employment tribunal applications, which rose last year by 40% to nearly 63,000 equal pay applications in front of employment tribunals. Massive increase in the cost of the taxpayer. Um, it's even, I mean, it's even screwed up the unions who found themselves in a situation where the, the pay increases which were associated with job evaluations were threatening to cost jobs. Therefore, the unions um, struck a deal not to bring it in immediately, whereupon um, uh, no pay, no fee lawyers, and no win, no fee lawyers got on the case, and you've got uh, tranches of women and some men, incidentally, who've been taking the, the unions to tribunals because they've made deals which have sold their members down the river, that's the argument anyway. So it's been, a, uh, it's been a, a very, very messy business and the prospect of extending this to the private sector is something I, I certainly wouldn't advise. I would also say that in the longer term, I don't actually believe that it will succeed in narrowing the pay gap by very much. It will produce distortions because pay grading takes no account of job performance or of market conditions. So, if, if you take an example of, 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 of two jobs which have been rated very similarly now, blokes working on the bins and women cleaning offices. The idea is that they involve the same levels of you know, know-how, problem solving and accountability, therefore they should be paid the same. But what you do when you impose a similar pay scale is that um, you get uh, an excess supply of people wanting to be cleaners, which is a nice indoor job, and a shortage of people willing to hot hump bins around in the cold. And so as a consequence, you've got uh, excess supply here, which means unemployment, often, of, 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 of women cleaners, who then have to find less well-paid jobs in the private sector, and uh, you find a shortage of, of guys to lift the bins around. I mean, some women do it, but not very many. And so what employers have to do in that kind of situation is get around it in some way. So they offer various deals like golden hellos and you know, uh, extra payments for this and that and so forth, and regrading people. I mean, this is what happened in the Soviet Union. The, 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 the story I always tell about this is how in, 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 in Moscow in the 1960s, there were no people, uh, there were no people who um, were uh, described as secretaries. And the reason for this is under the kind of labour theory of value, secretaries were kind of the lowest of the low. This was unproductive labour. You know, it wasn't like working in a steel factory or something. It was unproductive labour. So you couldn't, you, you couldn't get secretaries. So what they had to do was describe all the secretaries as office managers or something like that so that they could actually attract enough at the rate of pay which has been set. This is the kind of thing which happens when you move away from markets and try to use administrative solutions to all this. Okay, that's the system which, uh, which uh, I, I fear that uh, 
where Harriet Harman is leading us if she gets the opportunity to, uh, to do that. Maybe she won't. Okay, well, I'm going to wind up now. Thinking back to uh, what I was talking about at the beginning, um, you know, Hammurabi's megalomania, putting people to death for minor offences and stuff, oh, it doesn't work anymore. You've got to be soft and cuddly these days to work in, the, to work in business. Um, so I don't think Hammurabi is coming about. We don't face that kind of merciless tyranny. What I think we face instead is Guardian readers um, being very nice and moderate who want to help people and they think the way to do this is to impose restrictions on pay, impose restrictions on the working of the labour market. I think we should resist this. Hayek warned us about this, of course. Hayek, uh, you know, Hayek, Hayek was not some kind of dreadful class warrior. I mean, he got on very well with Keynes, for example, very, very friendly with Keynes in some ways. And if you read The Road to Serfdom, you know, it's addressed to socialists of all parties, isn't it? And the idea is that, that people, uh, you know, Hayek's view is that people, their ideals aren't, aren't even, there's nothing wrong with that. But it's the old lesson that the road to economic hell is paved with good intentions. You know, that's the thing which, which, which Hayek tries to put over to us. So I, what I'm saying, I guess, is that market determined pay differentials, which anyway probably don't last forever because there's a constant shift of, of what type of jobs are in demand and, 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 and whatnot. But market pay, uh, determined pay serves a vital economic function in allocating employees to areas where their work is most valuable. It allows opportunities for individuals to progress. It provides signals, clear signals to people about how they can progress, what kind of things they should be going, what kind of fields students should be going into, for example, when they leave the university or whatever. If you don't have these signals, well, in a closed economy, of course, you end up like they did in East Germany, where you get, uh, you get a situation where, where, where wages don't adjust, so you actually end up having to allocate people to jobs because they, they won't go to areas where the jobs are, are, are not, you know, where the pay isn't increased. So your first job, if you, when you graduated in Eastern Germany, was where you were sent. You know, the planners sent you somewhere as your first job. So in a closed economy, you can get away with that kind of thing, perhaps, although we saw that you know, East Germany uh, folded up. But nowadays, of course, you can't, realistically, you can't do that. We've got open, open economies. So the way in which trying to rigidify, is, can, is there such a word, uh, to, to, to make rigid the, 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 the labour market in, in an economy like the UK is that you just shift the problem around. Um, Shortages of labour will persist, prices will be higher than they might be otherwise, unemployment will rise and so forth, but people can get out of it in some sense. People can move abroad. They can, you know, you, can, you, you can't pin them down in, in quite that way. But what you would predict, I guess, is that you would have people devoting a lot of uh, activity to political lobbying, to try to get the rules changed, to get the... The, 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 you know, the job specifications, re, 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 I'm talking about not, not political lobbying in the sense of parliament, but within firms, you know, spending a lot of time trying to, to lobby to change the structure and things like that, and you should be concentrating on getting on with whatever the job is that, they, that, that, that you should be doing. So, I, I, you know, I think messing around with pay, um, trying to reduce pay inequality, brings in its train so many problems that I'm sure... Uh, I don't have to persuade people who've come along on this wet night here to listen to this kind of thing. I don't sure I have to persuade you. But what I have to tell you is you've got to go out and persuade other people of this because there are a lot of silly people around who are trying to make these kind of changes.